going to ask you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 23. We've been working our way through um, several of the Psalms, and it's looking at a gospel primer, looking through the Psalms, and we see in the Psalms so much about life and so much about the Christian life and, and the highs and the lows and all of those things. But before I really get started, I wanted to take this moment to, um, tomorrow we celebrate Veterans Day um, in our nation, and it, it is only appropriate that we pay respect to those who um, have served our country, those who um, have gone and have served in harm's way for us, that we wouldn't have to. Many of us will never know what that is like. And uh, so I, I wanted to take this opportunity. Um, and then I also want to let you know that this afternoon at 3.30, I believe, um, up at the high school, there's going to be um, a celebration as well. And I wanted to make you aware of that. But I, I just wanted to take this opportunity. We, we celebrate Christ. We celebrate God, but we honor people because we are made in His image and because as His people we should celebrate the good that the Lord does through us. And so we want to make sure we do that today. If you um, are a veteran of our armed forces, will you just stand and let us pay our respects to you and let you know how much we appreciate you and your service. Um, and Thank you. And uh, this is a day to remember those who have served, but we should always be remembering those who are serving now um, as well. And remember to pray for them. Remember to um, send ways of encouraging them. And that's a great, a great reminder out here in our Welcome Center that you can be a part of encouraging them in the Lord as they're serving our country and serving to protect our freedom to be able to gather here. Um, for those who have fought in wars overseas, a lot of the freedoms that they have kept for us, we get to exercise today by gathering together. There are people around the world who are believers in Christ who don't get to do what we're doing today. If they do it, they do it in secret. They do it in hiding because for fear of their government or their friends or even their family members um, and the, really the pain and the persecution that would come. And so I, I want us to remember that. I want us to be faithful to pray and to be faithful to go and use the freedom that the Lord has given us um, through those who have served our country. Um, that we have this freedom and we can't waste it. We need to use the freedom that we have. Um, so pay respect and pay honor where honor is due. That's a very biblical notion. And so this is a great opportunity for us to do that as a nation and as people who follow after what the Bible says. Um, Psalm 23, one of the best known Psalms. But before I really get into it, I wanted to read to you what I believe is the New Testament version, if you would, of Psalm 23. So Psalm 23 is well loved. It's used in times of pain and sorrow. It's used in time of loss. We'll read it this afternoon in a memorial service. Um, and, and it's used in such a way that it brings comfort to those who hear it. Many of us have heard this psalm our whole life. Even those who aren't even really familiar with the Bible and familiar with Christ have heard Psalm 23 at some point in their life. Um, and the fact of the matter is uh, it brings comfort to many because it, it deals with things we are all dealing with. It deals with fear. It deals with need. It deals with the need to be comforted. But I do not believe that Psalm 23 is simply meant to bring us comfort. I think that there's something greater in Psalm 23 that we're meant to have and we're meant to be able to own as believers in Christ. And I think that John 10 gives a clue as to what that is. Um, because John 10, Jesus is claiming to be the very shepherd that the psalmist is writing about here in Psalm 23. So I'm just going to ask you to follow along. I'm going to read. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word if you want. You can follow along and read with me, but I'm going to be reading this aloud, and I want you, to, I want you to see this in John 10. It says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We use this psalm, Psalm 23, a lot of times in times of pain and in times of death. And we talk about going through the shadow of, valley of the shadow of death and we're going to escape that. But this doesn't seem to be one of those things where 
God wants us to go through that and simply know that we've escaped it. He says he wants us to live and live abundantly. And that's not with a bunch of stuff. That just It's a different kind of attitude and a different kind of life than a lot of us live with. He says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. We have a shepherd who not only leads us beside still waters, not only restores our souls, not only gives us green pastures, he's already laid down his life for us. And so today as we come as believers to Psalm 23, and if you're here today and you're not a believer in Christ, as you come to Psalm 23, what I want you to find here and what I believe the psalmist wants us to see, what David wants us to see is not just comfort, but something greater. He wants us to find security. Because we're all after comfort on some level, aren't we? Comfort is a big deal in our culture. Right? I mean, it's a big deal. Like, I got here this morning, and one of the first things I did when I walked in the door is I went and checked all the thermostats so that you would be comfortable. Right? Now, your idea of comfort and my idea of comfort may be completely different. Pat, for instance, you know, she wears a sweater, and she took it off today because they were up here, and she, but within 10 minutes of being out there, she'll probably put it back on at some point because she'll get cold. Her idea of comfort and my idea of comfort, completely different. Okay? I get in your... We now do that in cars, don't we? Like the driver's side has their air, so you can do it, and the passenger has theirs, so everybody can be comfortable at the same time. You mean rear air seat warmers, those are great, right? Uh, they're fantastic. And there's nothing wrong with comfort in that way, but we're really big on comfort. We've gotten so good at the comfort thing that our lives, for the most part, are lived within a 10 degree range, right? So, like, somewhere between, like, 65 and 75, you live the majority of your life, right? Because you go outside, and you, if it's cold, you put something on so you can get up to between 65 and 75, and you can feel that way. You go to your house, and you change the air and the heat to make sure it falls within a range. We have gotten so good at comfort that we live within 10-degree range. The rest of the world thinks we're crazy, well, I mean, you go places and it's 115 degrees in the shade and, you know, they're drinking lukewarm Cokes. Like, this is a nice day. I think we're crazy. Thomas preached last week and he preached the first service down there like I typically do. He got up here second, <laughs> second service afterwards. He's like, dude, it's hot up there. <laughs> I'm like, yes, because... For your comfort of being able to see, we have 73 lights all trained onto my face right now. I'm sorry for that. Okay, but the fact of the matter is we're really big on comfort. And comfort's not a bad thing. We, we've made our lives very comfortable. But let's not mistake comfort for need, first of all. And secondly, let's not mistake comfort for security. Because you can get a really nice comforter. Isn't that interesting what we get, like on your bed? Okay. You can have your security blanket, right? You can have your flashlight. You can have your air and your heat set to the perfect comfortable temperature in your house. And you can go to bed tonight and somebody can come and smash in your windows and smash in your door and steal everything that you have because you're still not secure. It's a big difference, isn't it? It's a big difference. Comfort often can lead us to not seek after what we really need, which is security. A lot of people are comfortably insecure because they place their security and their hope in being comfortable. I believe Psalm 23 points us to something greater. I believe Psalm 23 points us to a shepherd who promises us security if he's our shepherd. He's the type of shepherd that not only loves us, but he's the type of shepherd that went so far as to show us how much he loved us so that when the wolves came, he took all of the 
pain and all of the beating and all of the death from the wolves. So that when our sin would separate us from him, he took all of the initiative to close that gap by taking our sin upon himself on the cross. That's the type of shepherd we have. He's the type of shepherd who can be called a good shepherd because at the first sign of danger, he's not just out the door. Uh, he, he stands and he fights. There's only one time in Psalm 23 that comfort is even mentioned. And, and it's around this image in verse 4. He's holding a rod and a staff. Now, I don't know when the last time your kids found comfort in the fact that you could discipline them with a rod or staff. I don't know, I don't know where, their comfort, where your comfort lies with that, that. When I see rod and staff, big strong guy with rod and staff, my first thought is not... Oh, warm fuzzies. I mean, it's not, just not the way I think. I think power. I think authority. Right? I, and not necessarily comfort. But if I know that the big, strong shepherd has the rod and the staff and he's on my side, and he's my shepherd, I feel secure. And I want you to have that security today because so many of us have placed our security in just being comfortable. And that security won't last. Our security has to be found in Christ. When the psalm says that our cup flows over, that's not talking about stuff. It's not talking about the blessings that we count as blessings that we just gather in and hoard for ourselves. The overflowing cup here is knowing who your shepherd is. That he is yours and you belong to him. The joy that's found in him no matter what the circumstances, no matter how uncomfortable things get. So I want to just look at a few areas of security that the psalmist points out here. Uh, security that's promised to us if the Lord is our shepherd. The first is this. There's a security in the face of need. Look at what it says. Look at verse 1. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Okay, We need to eat. We need to drink. Right? We need rest. We need... Lots of stuff. Now, in our culture, we tend to confuse needs with wants a lot. Okay? In our culture, we tend to think when our wants aren't desires, we need something. It's kind of the way we operate most of the time. Whereas, in the rest of the world, just being able to like, have indoor plumbing is a plus. You know, if, we, if we lived in most of the world and we said, wow, I'm poor, they would say, yeah, my car, and I said, my car is breaking down, and I can't afford to get it fixed. And they're like, you own a car? But we can really get mixed up on what a need is and what a want is. Now, that's not to make us feel guilty for owning cars. That's just a reality check for us. That often, we've replaced our comfort with the idea of what a real need is. We, we, we just... We replace that and we say, these are the things I need to make me happy. A lot of those things are just wants. A lot of those things are actually the very things that are standing in the way of us finding real happiness. Because we're finding comfort but not security. And so we as God's people, and, and this, is, this is Christians, this is non-Christians, this is Buddhists, Muslims, around the world. We're constantly looking for the thing that will make us happy. And what we're told here is if the Lord is your shepherd, he's going to take care of every need you have. You don't have to worry about it. You have security because he's your shepherd. Jesus put it this way. He, he, he said, look, you worry about what you're going to eat. You worry about what you're going to wear. Stop worrying about those things. You worry about tomorrow when it has enough problems of its own. Stop worrying. Just look at the flowers and look at the birds and see how your Father provides for them. And aren't you more valuable than any of those things? So seek the Lord. Seek His kingdom. Seek His righteousness. And all that you need will be added to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When it says want there, it doesn't mean I'm just going to get a whole bunch of stuff. What it means is I'm not going to have any needs that aren't met. I, I guess I've I got to ask you, do you trust God to actually meet your needs? Do we pray, give us this day our daily bread, and really believe that God is the one who provides our daily bread? 
Or do we take that responsibility on ourselves and so we just kind of keep it and hold it in because it's ours. If Jesus is yours and you're able to let go of a whole lot of other stuff because you're secure. So security in the face of need. Security in the face of guilt. We're able to actually have security in the face of guilt. Look at verse Three, it says, he restores my soul. Man, that just sounds really great to me. Okay, the, the image here is uh, there's a sheep laying down in a green pasture next to still water, feeling secure and restored. Now, why would a sheep, why would any of us need to be restored? My, my guess is that if somebody or something needs to be restored, they did something wrong, right? If it needs to be restored, there, there was some fading away or running away, or you're just the ornery sheep. Okay? And if, if you don't know any ornery sheep, you're the ornery sheep. That's just the way it works. Okay? So you're sitting there going, I, you know. The, the fact of the matter is, there are sheep that just constantly are fighting the shepherd. And here's what if he's your shepherd, he restores your soul, he brings you close. That's the idea. He doesn't keep pushing you away. He restores, he, he gives you everything you need and He pulls you close. Not only does He pull you close and say, okay, now I've restored your soul. So the way the New Testament would put it would be, He's made us new. But then He leads us in a path of righteousness. He leads us in the right way to go. And this is what most of us live our lives like. I, I'm just going to, I can guess that this is the way most of us live, is we live our lives this way. We, we feel guilty for something, so we try to come back and we go, I'm sorry, right? Then then when we say I'm sorry, we hope we're taken back. And then we're taken back and we mess up again and we feel like, oh, I've got to do something else to make up for that again. So I'm sorry. And then we hope we're taken back. And before long, 12 I'm sorry's later, we realize that, and we begin to feel like we were never really taken back. Maybe there's just something wrong here. And guilt takes us over. What we're told here, he restores you. And then he leads you in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Which simply means this, he makes you new and then he gives you the path to walk on. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that He laid out beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, He's made us new, we're His workmanship, and then He gave us the path to walk. And most of us probably spend a lot of time worrying about, am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right way? What am I supposed to do now? I don't know. Good news. Security is He's leading you. Not only did He lead you to everything that you need, He's leading you to your future. And He's leading you to what you're supposed to do. And the security here is not just wrapped up in the fact that He's leading you. It's why He's leading you. Look at the end of verse 3. He's leading you in a path of righteousness. He's leading you in the right way, the way to please God. He's leading you in a way that's right and pure for His name's sake. Yeah, now, if you want to make sure there's security... Like, have it mean something to the person that's giving the security, right? If you want to make sure, like, for my kids to feel secure, they need to know that it means something for me, the way they live, the way they act, the way... They need to know that I love them, and my love is, is, is to show how much I love them, not just based on how they are and how they act. And that's the way it is with God. With God, what we're told here is He shows us the way to go. He restores us for His namesake. So that everybody else will be able to look at God and say, Oh, He's loving, He's kind, He's gentle. He's holy, He's perfect. He doesn't push away. He draws in. He's saving, He's restoring, He's making new. So many of us, when we're walking around with this guilt on us all the time, what we're really saying is God doesn't really forgive. That's what we're saying. When we're walking around feeling the weight of this guilt all the time and not going to the shepherd for security and for restoration and for a path, and we're constantly going, oh, I just don't know, I just don't know, I'm worrying, I'm worrying, I'm worrying, I'm feeling guilty. What we're basically saying to everybody else is, you can't really trust God. God. 
That's, that's hard for us to deal with, I think, sometimes. But the reality of this situation for us is our security demonstrates His greatness. So that doesn't mean if you're going out and doing all the dumbest things you can do that you should go, well, I mean, I'm secure. Grace, right? <laughs> no, but when you feel guilty, you know you can be restored. You don't run to something else to feel comfort. You run to Him to be secure. We can have real security even in the face of guilt. We can have real security in the face of fear and death. So there's security in the face of need, security in the face of guilt, and security in the face of fear and death. Back to the passage, it says in verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Fear and death are all around us. We, we, Harold was in a car accident this week. And pulled out in front of somebody. We, I saw a car accident happen as I was going to school to pick up the girls this week. And, and you don't know what's going to happen. Fear and death are all around us. We, we, many of you live in fear. Because of the unknown. And what's going to happen next? Where's our country going? What's... And we're told that no matter what the fear is, whether it's death, whether it's danger, whatever it is, we don't have to fear. It doesn't mean that those things aren't real. It just means that we have security. Because we have the one who is holding the rod and the staff. And as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we walk through where all the fear is and where all the death is, which is in life for us. This is just reality for us. He's with us. That's what it says. I will fear no evil. It's not just that I won't fear death. It's not just that I'm not going to fear that person or that thing. I'm not going to fear any evil because you are with me. See how our security is wrapped up in Him and who He is. Not in what we've done, not in where we are, not in our circumstances, not in our comfort, but in who He is and the fact that He's with us. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know everything that's going on in your life, but I know that fear is everywhere in our culture. Fear is everywhere in our lives. Fear of the unknown, fear of the future, fear of the past, fear of our mistakes, fear of making a mistake. It's all kind of fear. Cancer seems to touch every single family in our church and in our community. We have family members and friends and loved ones who are overseas, who are in harm's way every day. And, and as we go through these fears, we don't have to fear. It's not that they aren't real. It's not that the evil isn't real. It's that God is real and stronger and greater. And so whether it's worry or fear, when we don't find our security in Him and we run to something else for comfort, we're basically saying to the world, God isn't who He says He is. He's not really a good shepherd. I want you to look at the other side of fear. This is specifically for believers. Look at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. We can have security in the face of fear and death and all of the stuff that just comes on to us in normal life. But as believers, we can have security as well. Because I'm going to guess if you're like me, your first choice for dinner guests is not going to be your enemies. Right? When, when you get together with your spouse or with your family, you're like, who should we have over to dinner this week? We should have somebody over to dinner this week. Oh, uh, I don't know. Is that, real, that dude who hates me at work, we should, we should call him. Right? Probably not going to be first choice. Okay, probably not going to be the neighbor who annoys you, right? It's probably not going to be that person who's never said a nice word to you. Those probably aren't going to be the first people you call up. Maybe you're not like me, but those would not be the first people I would call, okay? But, you know, we, we all know that you're supposed to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. The problem is enemies at dinner, no, right? I mean, we, we can keep them close, just not have dinner with them. But we're told right here that the Lord is preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. That does not sound like fun to me. Anybody else? Anybody think that would be fun? Hey, here are my enemies. Let's, let's like hang out. 
But that's what we're told. He's preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, what does that mean? What that means is you're going to have enemies as a believer. You're going to have people who are going to stand up and they're going to say all kinds of things about you because you stand for Christ. Right now, it's happening around the world. Right now, imagine we were in Indonesia and we were believers. Number one, there wouldn't be as many of us. Number two, we'd be in a room that would probably be 12 by 12. Many of us would be in fear because of our family and friends. If we were in the Sudan, if we were in Afghanistan, if we were in Iran, if we were in China, all over the world right now, believers are being persecuted because of their faith. Their, their family members are turning them into authorities. Some of them are just disappearing. And what this verse says is you don't have to fear even in the presence of your enemies. You're secure in the presence of your enemies. He's providing for you. Not only that, he's lavishing his love on you and his provision on you. He's preparing a table before you and he's setting you apart. That's what it means to anoint your head with oil. There's basically two meanings here. One, you're being set apart. The anointing of the head with oil would set you apart. And in front of your enemies, in front of the world, you're going to be shown to be a follower of Christ and a believer and someone who's God, who God's love and favor has been put on. You're going to be set apart. The other side of it is that when you speak and you're beaten down for it and persecuted for it, anointing your head with oil would be healing and protection and provision and Here's the good news. Our enemies are going to be against us, but we don't have to fear. We don't know what it's like to be persecuted here in America. We just don't. Some of you have friends that won't talk to you because you're a Christian, and that, that's its own form of persecution. But the reason we don't need to have persecution here in America it's because the difference between America and most of the other countries where persecution is happening is in those countries when people are persecuted, they don't shut up. They keep talking about Christ. They keep talking about the gospel and the gospel keeps spreading. We're already so quiet about the gospel. Why would we need to be persecuted? The enemy already knows that death is victory for us as believers because we go to be with Jesus. So his goal is not to kill you as a believer. His goal is to keep you quiet. So why would we need to be persecuted if we're already being quiet? If we're truly secure and not just looking for comfort, then even in the presence of our enemies, we'll be set apart and we won't be silent. Because we have security in a real shepherd who's a good shepherd, who's with us, who has already taken everything that the enemy could throw at him. And he took it to the cross. And he rose again. And he defeated sin and death. So your enemy is already defeated. I've used this analogy before. The enemy that we're having this table prepared before it's like a cockroach that's already been stomped on. And it's just kind of on its back doing this thing. The death throes of the cockroach. It's basically what our enemy is doing now. It's already defeated. Powerful. Still gross. But defeated. Real security will mean that you'll be set apart. You'll live set apart. It'll be obvious who you are what you stand for, whose you are, but you also won't be silent. Because there's no need to fear. Security in the face of need, security in the face of guilt, security in the face of fear and death, and finally security in the face of forever. Look at the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that's the life here on earth. That God's goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. It may not feel like it. It may not seem like it to everybody all the time. But it will be true. 
Because security may not look like comfort. Security may look like losing everything on a worldly sense, but knowing you have Christ. It's happening for a lot of people around the world. It's happened for centuries. It may happen for you, but you can be secure. I'm not telling you to go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. If you did that, and you did it because Christ has told you to do that, it wouldn't be my job to celebrate you anyway. That would be Jesus' job to celebrate you. If you did it out of guilt, it wouldn't do you any good anyway. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to feel guilty for having a nice house. I'm not telling you to feel guilty for that. God's provided for you. What I'm telling you is if you have a nice house, you better use it for the kingdom of God. Because it can be taken away. I'm not telling you to feel guilty. What I'm telling you is you don't have to feel guilty. Because he has a path of righteousness for you. And his goodness and his mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life if you are his. But not only in this life, it says this at the end, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That same goodness and mercy are going to be yours forever. You're going to be with them. You're not just going to be a visitor in God's house. You're going to be a member of his household forever. So I want you to see this. There's a... There's something that ties this whole thing together that makes us be able to be secure. Okay? And it's not just thinking the right things. It's not just doing the right things. It's not that at all. The key to all of this is found in one little two-letter word in verse 1. This is what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. My. You have no security unless he's your shepherd. I have no security unless he's my shepherd. My only hope is not going to be found in some distant deity or someone or something that's out there somewhere. But the hope is he's with me. He loves me. He restores me. He leads me. He follows me. He dwells with me. He's the one who provides for me. He's the one who is my everything. So the key is this has to be personal. He's got to be your shepherd. The hope then that you can have is not just that you would know that God is good, but you'll begin to experience that God is good. It's not just, just that you'll read in the Bible that God is good or hear people talk about God being good. You begin to experience his goodness no matter what the circumstance because when you stop seeking comfort and start seeking security and you find your security in him, then even the most uncomfortable situations, you see his goodness in it. Even when things are taken away, you begin to see his goodness. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to see that, but you begin to see it. You begin to experience it. So the reality for us is that this doesn't mean you're not going to go through fear. This doesn't mean that you're not going to go through death. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through hardship. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to go away. It doesn't mean that he's just going to lavish on you a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that death and fear and confusion are not the end of the story. Because they are not the ultimate reality. Our shepherd is. Everything else in this passage is contingent on the shepherd being good and being able to do what he promises. Do you believe that he is who he says he is? That's what this all comes down to. For the believer, for the person who's been in church their whole life, for the person who may be saying, you know, I want to believe that he's everything. I want to find my joy in him. Stop seeking your joy in other things because the only way for your cup to overflow is for him to overflow it. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, I'd love to talk to you about that because I have spent an entire life trying to find comfort and it still hasn't happened because somebody always comes up with a better idea of what comfort is. But nobody's come up with a better idea of what security is. The one who's made me, the one who's created me, 
the one who holds me and the one who's promised me life forever. Today you have a choice as a believer. Are you going to find your security in Christ so that you'll be set apart and no longer silent? Um, Nick Ripkin, who wrote The Insanity of God, he said this. He said, if you're silent, you're siding with the persecutors. You're no longer siding with Christ. Because the goal of the persecutors is just to keep you silent. So as followers of Christ, we can't be silent anymore. And if you're not a follower of Christ, today can be the day where you just throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, I need a shepherd. I need security. I don't want comfort anymore. I just want to know. I want to know for sure that I'm loved. I want to know for sure that I'm made clean. And throw yourself at the feet of Jesus, the one who's already walked the path and paid the price for you. I want to talk to you about that. There's other people here who wouldn't want to talk to you about that. So, as we close, let's close with this mentality. We're going to be celebrating Patty's mom's life this afternoon. We're going to be visiting those in the hospital who are going through pain and sorrow. You're going to have a tough week or a good week this week. You're going to find comfort in certain things. Every time you find comfort in stuff, you open when it's cold this week and you open up your cookbook, you know, that comfort food when you turn on your crock pot. So I'm going to guess if you're like me, you don't turn in your crock pot to make a gourmet meal, right? It's for comfort food, right? When you're trying to find comfort, and so every time you think about being comfortable this week, realize that God has designed you for something more than comfort. He wants you to be secure. And he wants you to find your security in him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you, in your goodness, would move in us, that we would find our security in you. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.